Glad to be in the house of God today. I know this is a hotel, but on Sundays it turns into a place of worship, and uh, we are excited for that. Um, before we dive in, I'm actually going to ask us to stand one more time. I know you're like, oh, I just got comfortable. But uh, would you stand? We're going to pray for what happened in Buffalo. We know that there was a racially charged shooting. And so we just want to pray for um, all those that were affected. Heavenly Father, we come before you, God, and we just lift up every person that has been uh, affected by this demonic shooting, God. Heavenly Father, as Christians, we uh, pray against racism. We pray against uh, division of this kind. Heavenly Father, I pray, Lord God, that your grace and mercy will be there. And Heavenly Father, in this darkness, may your gospel light shine. I pray, Lord God, that you will just minister in Jesus' name, amen, and amen, and amen. All right, you may be seated. Um, so I just recently got back from a couple days spending some time with Becca for my birthday, and we got to go to the beach and, and eat some food, and I got to read some of my books and eat some food, and then we got to go and uh, we got to explore some of the old missions that were around there and eat some food, and then we went to Hertz Castle, which was awesome, and ate some food, and so it was like the perfect time away. I just loved it, and so I'm coming to you refreshed and full and, uh, and really excited, and I hope that uh, you guys uh, will be able to find the rest of today rest, uh, a restful day for you as we all start our week on Monday. Amen? Amen. Amen. Well, we are halfway through this series called Dear Inspire. Dear Inspire. And as a way of reminding you, what we're doing is we are looking at letters that were written to seven churches in the book of Revelation. They were written to seven churches in Asia Minor, which is modern day Turkey. And uh, these letters were uh, written uh, uh, from Jesus Christ. And what I mean by that is Jesus appeared to John um, about 60 years after Jesus resurrected from the dead. Um, and so he appeared to John in his glorified body, much like he did to Paul on the road to Damascus. And he gave John one revelation, which is the book of Revelation. But in there, he wrote seven, Jesus wrote seven uh, letters to seven churches. In fact, if you have like a red letter Bible, right? So one of those letter, one of those Bibles that every time Jesus speaks, it, it types it out in red ink. Um, you'll see that all of these letters are in red. Um, and so he is writing to these churches. And even though the Bible was not written to us, right? We know that the Bible wasn't written to us, but it was written for us. Right, the Bible was written to different people, different churches, different different groups, but it was written for us. And so what we're asking is if Jesus were to write a letter to inspire, what would he say? What would he uh, commend? What would he praise? What would he challenge, right? What, what would he say to inspire? And so what we're doing is we're looking at these seven letters and, and we're seeing, are there principles that we can extract from the text that the Holy Spirit would want us to learn and be transformed by? Now, what we've seen so far, I think, if you've been able to listen, and if you haven't, please go to YouTube or our podcast or whatever, and you can get caught up there. But one thing that I think you will be able to see is that despite the historical distance, right, the cultural differences between first century Turkey and 21st century Bay Area, I think one of the conclusions we might be able to bring to the forefront is when it comes to being a Christian, not much has changed. Not much has changed. Now, even though the belief in God is no longer axiomatic, right, there are other alternatives. And so we, we understand that, but there's the same struggles and temptations of what it means to live out your faith in Jesus Christ. To be a follower of Jesus uh, 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 Christ, uh, kind of, we deal with the same issues that people had 2,100 years ago. And what we've seen is that despite that fact, that it is still a struggle to live out your faith. Now, what's interesting is, 
in cities particular, it seems, for these churches. These churches were in seven cities. And cities present a very unique challenge because both cities and churches are communities, right? And they both birth and give shape to culture. They're both communities and they both form and shape culture. That's what cities do and that's what churches are supposed to do. And so because of that, then sometimes what happens is those cultures clash. How many of you guys ever feel like the culture of Christianity and the culture of those around you clash at times, right? There's a clashing. And so even though belief in God is no longer axiomatic because there's, you know, sort of these other alternatives, what that means is in certain milieus, it will become very difficult for one to even sustain or hold on to their faith. In certain environments, you might not even feel that adhering to one's Christian ethic is even an eligible possibility, And that is the reason that there is so much provocative imagery throughout the whole book of Revelation. Because God is trying to get our attention. As one scholar put it, the book of Revelation is there to purge and refurbish the Christian imagination. Because everybody in here, you and me, we are constantly being shaped by the culture we exist in, the communities we live in, the, the, the images of the Bay Area that surround us. They change us. They shape us. And so I believe today's message will resonate with many of us in the room. Now, as a reminder, when we look at these letters, every letter kind of has the same outline. So the first part is Jesus is describing himself, who he is, in a unique way to that particular community. And so every letter, we begin to see a new aspect, a new facet of who Jesus is. And then the next thing that Jesus does is he gives accommodation. He gives a praise, what, what the church is doing well, what he, what he applauds them in, uh, what, what he is happy about. Next, he gives a challenge, an area where he tries to challenge them and say, hey, listen, this is where you need to work on it. And then finally, the last part of each letter, letter is he gives some sort of covenant language, some sort of promise that, hey, if you do this, here's what will be the natural outworking of, of, of being able to hold on to this faith. So let's see if you can see this in Revelation chapter 2, starting in verse 18. Revelation chapter 2, starting in verse 18, it says this, to the angel of the church in Thyatira, write, these are the words of the Son of God, whose eyes are like blazing fire and whose feet are like burnished bronze. So there he is. Jesus is saying, listen, my eyes are like blazing fire. My feet are like burnished bronze. I know your deeds your love and faith, your service and perseverance, and that you are now doing more than you did at first. Nevertheless, so there was who he is, there's the, the, the accommodation, the praise, and now here's a challenge. Nevertheless, I have this one thing against you, or I have this against you. You tolerate that woman Jezebel who calls herself a prophet. By her teaching, she misleads my servants into sexual immorality and eating of food sacrificed to idols. I have given her time to repent for her immorality, but she is unwilling. So I will cast her on a bed of suffering, and I will make those who commit adultery with her suffer intensely unless they repent of her ways. I will strike her children dead. Then all of the churches will know that I am he who searches hearts and minds and I will repay each of you according to your deeds. Now I say to the rest of you in Thyatira that to you who do not hold to her teaching, who have not learned Satan's so-called deep secrets, I will not impose any other burden on you except to hold on to what you have until I come. To the one who is victorious, here's the promise, here's the covenant language. To the one who is victorious and does my will to the end, I will give authority over the nations. They will rule over them with an iron authority over the nations. Oh, sorry. They will rule over them with an iron scepter and will dash them into pieces like pottery. Just as I have received authority from my father, I will also give that one the morning star. Whoever has ears, let him hear what the spirit says to the churches. Wow. That's some powerful statements. Pretty stark. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I pray that we will 
Do exactly as the text says, that we will have ears to hear what the Spirit is saying to the churches. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. See, when we come to this letter, when we look at this church, what we need to recognize is that the background of this church is actually much different than the background of all the other churches that we have read up to this point. See, all of the other churches have faced heavy persecution, heavy pain and suffering for their faith that they have found themselves many times faced with death as a consequence of being a follower of Jesus Christ. But not this church. This church, actually what we see is the opposite. What, what we see is, is we don't really see much suffering come to them as a result of their faith, but instead what, what, what we see and what they see themselves doing is flourishing. 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 Look at verse 19. I know your deeds, your love and faith, your service and perseverance. You are now doing more than you did at first. As a church, they were absolutely thriving. It was essentially a church filled with overachievers, which I think many of us here can relate with. It was a flourishing church that existed in a flourishing city. And so the temptation of that church in Thyatira what they faced was not the same temptation that the other churches faced. See, the other churches, because of the heavy persecution, they, 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 they didn't like the world. They, they, didn't, they didn't want to be a part. They looked forward to a new world, to, to a new reality, to heaven. They looked forward to it, but not this church. See, this church loved the world too much. They loved the world too much. And so out of all the churches that we're going to look at this series, this could possibly be the one that maybe we resonate with the most. Because we, like them, listen to this, Christians here in the West, our greatest danger isn't the threat of losing our lives for our faith, but wasting it. Our greatest threat here in the West isn't losing our lives because we're a Christian. Nobody's about to pound down these doors and come and kill us because of it, right? There's, there's not, it's not like there's a law in our country against Christianity. But our greatest danger is not losing our lives as Christians, but wasting it. Wasting it. Alan D. Potone, who was a British writer, he writes about these two great love stories that run through the narrative of, of human history. And he says this, every adult life can be said to be defined by two great love stories. The first, the story of our quest for romantic love. It's well known and well charted. The second story is our quest for love from the world. From the world. This one is more secret and a shameful tale. And yet this second love story is no less as intense in the first. It's no less complicated, important, or universal. And its setbacks are no less painful. The heartbreak here, there's heartbreak here too. See, the second love story. The second love story is the desire that we find love from the world. And that's what was tempting this church. The desire to be loved and recognized from the society around them. So what I want to do at the text is just talk about three things. No surprise there, right? Everyone, three things, okay. <laughs> Number one, the universal need to be seen. Number two, the pervasive fear of being seen. And number three, the gaze that we've always longed for. Number one, the universal need to be seen. I think the person who recognized this uh, need to be noticed is every single person. See, we become insecure regarding even our own existence because there is a universal need for us to be seen. Notice what philosopher and psychologist William James says. He puts it this way. No more fiendish punishment could be devised were such a thing physically possible than that one should be turned loose in a society and remained absolutely unnoticed by all the members thereof. If no one turned around when they entered a room or answered when they spoke, reminded what we did, but if every person we met cut us dead and acted as if we were non-existent, 
things, a kind of rage, an impotent desire would would before long well up within us from which the cruelest bodily torture would be a relief. Do you know what he's saying? He's saying this, you know what is probably the worst thing that could happen? Is for you to feel completely invisible, ignored, unloved, unvalued. For you to walk into a room and nobody ever notices. For you to speak and nobody ever responds. For you to be unseen. It would crush us. See, the church inside of Thyatira we're facing, it it, it wasn't a threat against like a physical suffering. It wasn't a, a, a physical persecution threat, but it was a threat of invisibility, the danger of becoming socially irrelevant. They didn't want to become socially irrelevant. They didn't want to become completely ignored. They were, they were, the, the threat was that they were going to be absolutely marginalized in their culture. And they were running the risk of, of, of being invisible because of their association with Jesus. They were running the risk of becoming utterly insignificant. See, let me just show you a little bit about what's going on in Thyatira. See, we've been hearing about all of these cities that have like these trade guilds, but Thyatira actually was the city that had most trade guilds. And so if you had any kind of trade, if you did, you know, leather work or woodwork, or if you were in, you know, spices and, or merchants or whatever it is, all of these trades, Thyatira actually had the most opportunities for you. They had the most guilds there. And, and, and the best way to look at what was happening here is that these guilds, uh, they were the power power brokers of society. So if you wanted economic influence, social power, cultural power, political power, whatever it is, the power brokers were in these trade guilds. So to remove yourself from the guild system would mean to remove yourself from the center of power, influence, acceptance in that entire culture, right? In that entire culture. Now, you say, well, what's the problem with that? Why would they want to remove themselves from those trade guilds? Well, because what would happen is in these guilds is is each kind of trade group would get together and you would begin to network. You'd begin to, you know, uh, rub elbows with the most influential or skilled people within those spheres that you maybe had a skill set with. And and so you would begin to have dinner and you would eat together. But but what would also happen in in these spaces is is that they were just... uh, saturated in pagan worship, in pagan deities, and sexual immorality. See, what would happen is you'd come together for a meal to network and so on and so forth. But in that, you would also offer up food sacrifices and in many cases engage in cultic prostitution and rituals. Now, for those that were Christians, when they converted to Christianity, they understood that if Jesus rose from the dead, then that meant there's only one God to be worshiped. And it was him. That was it. They also understood that to be a part of that community, to be a part of of that identity as believing in Jesus Christ, meant that you were called to live out a radically different ethic. Therefore, they found themselves at odds with their church culture and their uh, city culture. There was odds there. And this is where actually Jezebel comes in. Verse 20, nevertheless, I have this against you. You tolerate that woman Jezebel who calls herself a prophet. By her teaching, she misleads my servants into sexual immorality and the eating of food sacrificed to idols. Now, all commentaries, all New Testament commentaries, all New Testament scholars will say that who Jesus is referencing here is not a specific person, a physical, literal, specific person in that city, but rather he's speaking metaphorically. He is comparing this trade guild system, the system of how they, the, the culture was, to the woman Jezebel. And by saying this, he was definitely getting their attention because they knew their own history better than we did. See, if you go back and read the book of 1 Kings, Jezebel was a daughter of one of Israel's neighbors. She was not a Jew, but Ahab, who was the king of Israel, thought it would be politically expedient for them to get married. 
And, 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 and so and in his mind, he kind of had it all rational. He said, listen, I'm still going to be, I'm still going to follow the Ten Commandments. I'm still going to do all the things I'm supposed to do. I'm still going to worship God. Uh, I'm still going to obey, you know, but, but this is actually good for everybody. He's like, you know, how, how bad can it be? So he rationalized it. But if you go back and read 1 Kings, what you realize Jezebel does is after the honeymoon, she invites 850 pagan priests to come in. And she begins a campaign of systematically killing off all Jewish priests of God. And it almost destroyed the entire nation. And it started with something that didn't seem to be that bad. That on the surface seemed to be okay. And Jesus is saying that thing that you think is no big deal, that thing that you're compromising, that, you know, that, that, that thing they're saying, well, you know, he's saying it will destroy you. He's reinforcing the idea that there's no such thing as spiritual neutrality, that there's no such thing as moral neutrality. There's no such thing as harmlessly turning away from God in any one area of your life. Jesus says it's like Jezebel. It seems okay on the surface, but eventually it will destroy. And here's why. Because you and I, we will love and serve something. So like what happened with Ahab and Jezebel, thousands of years later in this church, in this city of Thyatira, what they were doing is they were trying to put forth a version of Christianity which isn't really Christianity at all, but they were trying to put forth a version of Christianity that enabled them to, on one hand, keep their faith, while on the other hand, keep their standing in society. Now, how much do we try to do that? All the time. All the time, right? And you can almost see their rationale behind it. See, their rationale was this. Listen, there's one true God. And so if there's one true God, then all of these other gods, well, they're fake. They're powerless. They're, they're, they're nothing. They're, they're not important. They're useless. You know? So what difference does it make if we go and sort of make believe that we're doing this? You know? And, uh, and, and when it comes to, you know, our bodies, well, what really matters is the spirit. These things are going to die and rot. And what really matters is heaven and the spirit. And so the idols don't matter and our bodies don't matter. So what difference does it make if we go and we, and we worship these, you know, kind of come in together and, and, and you know, offer a little food or, or engage in something with our bodies that we shouldn't? And we don't want to be legalistic after all, Right? We can still hold our positions of authority and prestige and status. We don't have to give all that up. And Jesus categorically condemns it, doesn't he? Yeah. I mean, look at the language he uses. This is, this is provocative language. Look at this. this. This should offend you. Jesus should offend you right here. Look what he says. He says, I've given her time to repent for her immorality but she is unwilling. So I cast her on a bed of suffering and I will make those who commit adultery and with her suffer intensely unless they repent of her ways. I will strike her children dead. Then all the churches will know that I am he who searches hearts and minds and I will repay each of you according to your deeds. My goodness. Jesus categorically condemns this. Why? Why such harsh language from Jesus? Oh, it's because of the second Love story, you see. You see, it's not really about sexual immorality, even though, yeah, that's not good. And it's not really about the offering of food to idols, even though, yeah, that's not good. But it's not really about that. What Jesus is really getting at is not the deeds, but the desires that drive those deeds. Do you see that? Can I ask you a question? Why do you want the things you want? What is the fuel that drives your ambitions? What is the desire underneath all of the desires that you have? You see, the real idol that was being worshipped wasn't Venus, it wasn't Jupiter, it wasn't anything like that. The real idol that was being worshipped here was the idol of influence, the idol of recognition, the idol of acceptance, the idol of status. That's what they really wanted. That's what we really want, isn't it? Love from this world, the second love story. 
See, the second love story is flamed by the universal need to be seen. We all need it. We need to be seen. But what's crazy is as much as we need it, we fear it. Number two, the pervasive fear of being seen. See, to some extent, the only thing worse than being looked past is being looked at. Really looked at. Looked out past the facades and past the masks and past it all, you see. See, deep down in the recesses of our soul, there is this strange, inexplicable kind of baseline fear of being discovered, of being exposed for the frauds that we sometimes fear that we might be. And so the only thing worse than being invisible is being utterly transparent. One of our favorite movies in our house is The Wizard of Oz. We love it. We watch it all the time. Growing up, you'd read the book, and it was an icon in American culture. And all of us, when we watch that or we read it, somehow we usually identify with one of the, char- one of the main characters, with Dorothy or Cowardly Lion or the Tin Man or, you know, the Scarecrow, right? And so we all want to be smarter. We all want to have a heart or we all want to have courage or whatever it is. And we're all trying to find our way home. Like, so we, we can relate to all of those, this journey. But, you know, as I get older, I began to realize that the real protagonist really isn't Dorothy. I mean, this movie that we watch, the movie isn't called Dorothy of Oz. It's called The Wizard of Oz, right? And this is a story, really, as I get older, about the wizard. And actually, as I get older, I realize I identify more with the wizard than with any of the other characters, It's actually kind of tragic because what happens is this wizard is in his hot air balloon and somehow it malfunctions and and because he crashed, he crashed into this place, into this land. And it was precisely because of his failure that the people around him saw him as this great wizard. And out of a fear of being found out, he gets people, and uh, I think this is more in the book than it is in the movie, but he gets people to go and to build an emerald city and if you remember the story, if you remember the book, the, the, the city actually isn't emerald. He has everybody wear gl- uh, green tinted glasses. It's all a facade. It's all fake, you see. And he gets people to busy themselves to make this emerald city, which isn't emerald at all. And, and every once in a while, what he'll do is he'll come out and he'll try and he'll, he would impress people with his great displays of power, which of course all along are just cheap parlor tricks. But notice this, in the end, and this is really interesting how this works out, but in the end, and this is where it is for me, his story becomes almost tragic. The wonderful wizard of Oz, the Oz and great and terrible, gets exposed for fraud by a little girl from Kansas who in a matter of few days accomplishes the feat that he was never able to accomplish. Do you guys see that? So here they are, and what's happening is, is the, if you remember the movie, the, the wizard is, is there, and his, his, he has a giant face that's projected on like these big clouds of smoke and, and fire, and all four of them are sitting, are standing there before the great and powerful Oz. But here they are, and this little girl exposed him. Because in a matter of days, she was able to accomplish what he could not by killing the wicked witch of the West. And this is the man from the film that has this great line, pay no attention to the man behind the curtain. It's that sheer pervasive fear of being seen for who we really are. Listen, church, God will not bless who you pretend to be. Or maybe you don't remember The Wizard of Oz. Maybe that wasn't for you. Maybe you're more like plays and Broadways and stuff like that. Our family loves that too. And, and so maybe you remember the play, The Death of the Salesman. It's a great, it's a great play. And so The Death of the Salesman is basically, is basically about the American dream. It's a story about this man named Willie Loman who lived out that dream by creating a fairy tale successful career as a salesman. Yet he always was restless 
He always was dissatisfied. He always was looking for something else. He described himself as living his life of, of riding on a smile in a shoe shine. His great desire, his ambition that drove and fueled all of his endeavors throughout the play was because he wanted to be remembered well. He wanted to leave a legacy. He wanted to be liked and loved and remembered by everybody. And as the play goes on, he goes and he actually think, begins to think about suicide. He contemplates taking his life and he justifies it by saying, because at my funeral, that's where I'll see it. That's where I'll see everybody there, everybody that cares and adores and everybody. They're going to come and they're going to say great things and they're going to weep for me. And, and, and that's where I'm going to see it. And, and I'm going to be remembered. Yeah. But if you remember the play at the end, the funeral comes and not a single soul shows up. Not one. Not one. The night the play opened back in 1949, they're on Broadway. The end was met with stunned silence. It was recorded that not one single person clapped. People just sat in their seats feeling raw because it, they, they had been utterly exposed. They met a playwright that saw right through their deepest fears and was merciless with them. See, the fear of being seen, right? Of being called out for the frauds that we sometimes are. And when Jesus introduces himself in the letter, notice what he says. He says, I am the one who has eyes like blazing fire. Later he says, I'm the one that searches the, the hearts and the minds. And he says, I see right through you. I see through the pretense and the charade. I see through it all. I see the most flawed places in your life. And it terrifies it. It terrifies us, doesn't it? We have a God who sees through us all the way down to the bottom. But the, but the picture gets worse. Because he doesn't just have eyes of flaming fire. The Bible says here that he has feet of bronze. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. These feet that can crush you. These feet that can totally destroy you. That sees you for who you are, but can crush you and destroy you. What do we do with a God like that? What do we do with a God that can see all the way down through our very souls, knows every inch and every part of us, all of our desires, all of our lusts, all of our lies, all of our sin, all of our brokenness, all of our hopelessness, and has feet that can absolutely crush us. On one hand, we want to be seen more than anything. On the other hand, we fear it more than anything. See, if we get exposed, we say, well what, well, what if that person rejects me? What if that person treats me different? What if, what if that person uses my struggles against me? Self-disclosure is indeed risky, yet any friendship or relationship that doesn't take the risk is a costly counterfeit to the real thing, guys. In other words, if you don't dare expose yourself to the risk of having your heart broken, if you say, I'm not going to do that, I'm not going to confess my hurts to other, anybody else, I'm not going to confess my sins, my proclivities, because at the risk of being rejected, then your only option to not having your heart broken is to having your heart hardened. And the only place where that's a reality is hell. C.S. Lewis put it this way, to love at all is to be vulnerable. Love anything, anything, and your heart will be wrung and possibly broken. He says this, if you want to make sure of keeping it intact, you must give it to no one, not even a pet. Wrap it up carefully with hobbies and little luxuries. Avoid all entanglements. Lock it up safe in a casket or a coffin of your selfishness. In a casket, safe, dark, motionless, airless. It, it will change. Oh, yes. Yeah. It will not be broken. Instead, it will become unbreakable. 
impenetrable, irredeemable. In other words, unsavable. Why? Because to love is to be vulnerable. The, the philosopher Sartre once said, hell is to be looked at. See, our fear of being known flows out of a fear of exposure because exposure opens us up to political, re to, to, the, to the potential, sorry, to the potential of rejection. Out of self-protection, we therefore keep other people at a distance, don't we? Yeah. Oh, yeah. The, be, and so the intimacy that we long for is also the intimacy that we fear. We are reluctant to go deep because if somebody found out, they might not accept us. Going back to that play, The Death of the Salesman, one thing that illustrates this point is that his son, his son who, idol, who, who, who worshipped him, uh, idolized him, uh, was going to the city that his father was out because his father would travel a lot. So he was going to the city to help him out with something only to discover that his father uh, was cheating on his mother and to discover that his father had cheated again and again and again. And so in the play, his father tries to explain and, and, and tries to say what happened. And, and the son looks at him and says, I want nothing to do with you and walks away. Isn't that our greatest fear? That we'll be found out and that the person that finds us out will say, I want nothing to do with you and walks away. Wow. Wow. See, we were built, we were originally built to be known and to be loved. And now we believe that we can't have both together. We believe we can either be loved but not really known, or we can be really known but then we won't really be loved. We don't think we can have them together. Because if, if we were really exposed, if somebody really looked bottom and see that we don't live by our own principles, we don't even live up to our own standards, right? We, we don't want people to see how anxious we are, how jealous we are, how upset we can get, how quickly we can become depressed, how unhappy we are, how disappointed, how lazy we are, how broken we are, how weak we are. We don't want anybody to see that. But there is somebody who can look through us with eyes of fire, who sees through us still again and again, deep and deep, and still says, I love you. And that's the gaze that we long for, isn't it? That's the gaze that we long for. See, in Christianity, the relationships that we have it has the ability to take risks because of the unshakable favor and loyalty of the safety net that Jesus provides us with. See, the gospel gives us the emotional wealth for self-disclosure, for, for a form of transparency, because there is a community of people that we can talk about our dreams and our fears and our loves and our sins and our struggles and our hatred. And we don't have to worry about it because guess what? There's nothing that we can present, that we can reveal to them that God doesn't already know, that hasn't already been nailed to the cross, that isn't already under the blood of Jesus Christ. It's all there. He handled it all. He covered it all. It's all been under the blood. You see... And so that frees us Amen. to be truthful with each other. At the end of this letter, he says, there is this reward for those who overcome. If you withstand, if you stay till the end, he says, this is your reward. And it's interesting what Jesus rewards. He says to them in Thyatira, he says, first, I'll give you authority over the nation. In other words, all of the influence, all of the power, all the recognition, all of that authority, he, that, that those things that drive you, he says, I'll give you all of that. The things that enslave you, the things that push you, he says, listen, I, I, I can give you that. The things that Jezebel, that system promises but can actually deliver, he says, I can. He says, but that's not the real reward. Notice that? See, the real reward isn't the authority or the prestige. That's just a side effect of the reward. The real reward, if you notice, he says, I'll give you the morning star. Now, what's that? The morning star. 
Well, we have to go back thousands of years. In the book of Numbers, chapter 24, we find ourselves face to face with another prophet. And with penetrating clarity, his oracle, he describes a vision and he writes this. He says, I see him and I behold him, but not near a star that will come out of Jacob. And then in Revelation chapter 22, Jesus, as he's closing this book, says to John, he says, I sent my angel to give you this testimony for the churches. I am the root of the offspring, the root of the offspring of David. He says, and the bright and morning star. Do you see that? In other words, in other words, Jesus is the reward. He's not the means to the reward, but we use him for that, don't we? We say, well, I want happiness, so I'll go to Jesus, and I want peace, so I'll go to Jesus, and I want to feel love, so I'll go to Jesus, and I want my life to be fixed, so I'll go to Jesus, and, and so what happens is Jesus is now, is now the way you get this. This is the reward, and, and Jesus is trying to say, no, 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 this is the side effect, the side effect of the real reward, which is him. Come on, come on. It's him, yes. you see. In the Garden of Eden, the Bible says, that after they ate the fruit, they saw that each other was naked and that they were ashamed. Now, this is interesting detail because in Genesis chapter 2, the, there it says that they saw that each other were naked and they weren't ashamed. So in Genesis 2, they weren't ashamed to be naked. Now they've eaten of the fruit. They've walked away from God. And now they saw that each other naked. Now they are ashamed. Well, what's changed? Well, not their nakedness. But their feeling about their nakedness. Why? Here's why. Because when they walked away from God, they walked away from the safety of being vulnerable. Because what's nakedness but to be completely vulnerable? Do you see that? They said they felt shame. What's shame? You know, there's some good definitions out there, but here's the best one that I came across. Shame is the sense of unease within yourself at the heart of your being. Shame is the sense of unease within yourself at the heart of your being. See, what he's saying here and what scripture is saying is this, is this, is that when we lose God, when we walk away from God, that there is a deep, radical, psychological dislocation. We're no longer at ease with who we are. There's a sense of inadequacy. When you lose who God is, you lose who you are. Do you see that? There is psychological alienation. There is a loss of identity and shame and painful self-consciousness and a desperate sense of insecurity and anxiety and fear, feeling like I have to do something to cover up this deep inadequacy that I feel. I have to do something to prove to myself and to everyone else that I'm okay. Why do we come in the world feeling this way? See that? There's something within us that feels shame and inadequacy because there's an alienation, there's a disconnect. When they walked away from God, they walked away from the ability to be fully seen and fully loved. And ever since then, we've been trying to find it. Humanity's been trying to find it. And so it says they hid and they try to put fig leaves together. And here's the problem. Here's the problem. If you cannot be transparent with God, if you cannot utterly trust God, then you can't be with transparent with anybody else. In other words, unless you are resting in, in the depth of your soul, unless you are resting in the assurance that God absolutely, totally, and fully loves you, that he delights in you, unless you delight in the fact that he delights in you, unless you know that in your innermost being that Jesus Christ loves you unconditionally, then you're never going to be able to move out in your other relationships, whether that's with a romantic relationship, whether that's with parents or kids, whether that's with your co-worker, with your boss, all of those relationships, you're going to go to those things to use them. To use them. Because, because they need to be there to fill something. 
to be able to do, you, you can feel worthy and you can feel accepted and you can feel loved. And if those relationships don't not line up with that, then all of a sudden you're offended and you're hurt. Maybe you'll even cut them off, unforgiveness. Do you see that? We use people. If you go without absolutely knowing God's love for you, then you're not ever going to be shown of your, uh, sure of your own lovability. You see? And then when you do choose to get in relationships with people, you, you, all you're going to do is cover yourself up. Dear Inspire, do you love this world more than you love me? Why do we have the fear of being exposed? Exposed for our hurts and our anger, our unforgiveness, our fears, our anxieties. Exposed for our imperfections. You see? You say, well, how do I know? How do I know if I love this world more? Then I love Jesus Christ. Well, notice what he said. He said, hold on to this until I come again. In other words, how do you know? Let me ask you this. Do you long for the return of Jesus Christ? Do you wake up every day hoping that today's the day that he comes back? Do you learn earn, or yearn for it? Do you long for it? Are you hungry for it? Are you waiting for it? Or are you like, no, not yet, Jesus? No, not quite. Ah, my friend, then you probably love this world too much. See, Jesus ultimately wants to tell this church in Thyatira that he says, listen, if you knew, if you only knew that the one who truly sees you also truly loves you, if you know this, then you'll be free from all those other desires. You'll be free from having to work yourself to the ground if you only knew the one who sees you, who thinks about you, and who loves you. One of these love stories will eternally demand from you while the other eternally gives to you. Why is it that we live our lives as if we can hide from God? Like, oh, I hope he doesn't see that part of me. Oh, my friend, he sees you. He sees down to your very core. He sees our joy. He sees our happiness. He sees what makes us tick. He understands us. He also sees our fraud our efforts to try to be somebody that we're not. And my question to you is this, as we get ready to close, will you stand vulnerable before God? Because if so, the Bible says that he won't just let you stand there naked, but that he goes and he covers you, he clothes you with his righteousness. You see, would you stand to your feet this morning? As we get ready to respond, I wonder if we can be, if we can relate to this church and say, you know what? Yes, there are times where I feel like my church culture and my city culture are clashing, my church culture and my home culture, my church culture and my class culture, my, my church culture and my work culture, my church culture and my friend culture. And, and, and yes, these things clash and, and, and I feel like I'm trying to hold on to both. And I have this universal need of being seen, but I'm scared. Would you just come to him this morning, vulnerable with it all, and let him clothe you with his righteousness because he sees you. Amen.
You see the disappointments, the lies, the lusts, the temptations. You see how we get angry. You see our thoughts. You see how we treat other people or when we become offended or jealous or envious, Lord God, depressed and sad, Heavenly Father. You see when we're joyful and celebratory, God. You, you know what makes us smile and what, and, and what invigorates us, Lord God. You see it all. 
every flaw, every broken thing, and yet you still love me, Jesus. There's no one else in this world that does that, God. Heavenly Father, I thank you for it, Jesus. And Lord, I hope that as you help us understand the reality of how much you love us, that we will be able to somehow be able to love you back in such a way that we look for you, that we long for you, God, more than anything in this world. In Jesus' name, amen, and amen, and amen. All right, guys, well, I hope you have a great week. See you guys at the meetups. God bless you.